So, so um, we are thrilled that another massive turnout. So it looks like six or so kid folks. So looks like you guys must be enjoying this series the so we're format. So, so again, if you haven't been to one of these, uh, what we're doing, obviously, if you're sitting facing me, you probably are here to see Dr. Wright, not me, and not get shoes. So we have a 20-minute clinic this evening on knees, lots and lots of knees. So Dr. Bright's going to go through a whole uh, seminar just on knee pain for the most part. Afterwards, and we're going to hold all questions until afterwards. Afterwards, we're going to go for a short run and walk in the neighborhood. And then you can join Dr. Bright and I next door, and we'll uh, enjoy some tasty beverages and refreshments, and you can ask questions there. And then uh, next week, we do have Sean Huffman on the schedule to do his Rogers and Walkers 10. However, he is not able to make it, so we're going to have to postpone that one to a further date. We'll get back to you on that one. So there is no session next Tuesday. Uh, but fortunately, we got Dr. Wright tonight. So, Dr. Wright? All right. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. thought Jeff was going to turn the treadmill around for me so I could do a workout while we did the talk, but uh, I think he just got out of the way. So, my name is Darren Wright. Um, I'm a family physician, did all my training in family practice, and did extra training in sports medicine. And I uh, was a team doctor, one of the team doctors at Ohio State for years, and we kind of broke away and started Max Sports. Within Max Sports, I'm kind of the endurance athlete doc. I mainly take care of runners, walkers, cyclists, for athletes, uh, whether it's for family practice needs or sports medicine needs, kind of uh, uh, whatever the, the needs are. And today, um, you know, historically with MIT, how many MITers do we have here? Yeah. A lot of MIT. All right. And how many future MITers do we have here? Yeah. All right, so, uh, uh, so in terms of uh, uh, what we've done historically, we used to have about a two or three hours, that might have been the full clip bar kind of talk, uh, where we did a lot of injury prevention and stuff like that. We focused on a lot of different things. We decided to break this down into smaller and smaller pieces. Just, you know, trying to hit you with a few things, so let's go have some fun. Um, and tonight, we're going to talk about knees. Um, how many people have had some knee issues running? And that's about right. About half of all runners are going to have some knee problems at some point. Uh, knee injuries are the number one uh, injury we see when it comes to running and walking. Uh, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about tonight, I'm going to use the word running, but sometimes it relates to running specific literature. Uh, but really, I find that the injury patterns and things I see relate whether it's runners or walkers. Uh, and really, when we look at IT band, we look at uh, runners knees, some of the things we're going to talk about here, is true of cyclists. You know, these are very common conditions in cycling, too. These are repetitive use injuries. Um, I don't like to say overuse uh, because that implies we did something wrong. Uh, these are more repetitive use. You know, we log enough files, these are some things that can creep up on you. So today we're going to talk about runner's knee and IT band. So let's talk uh, briefly. There we go. Uh, well, but, so I always like to just talk briefly about running. Uh, that's, that's my passion. So epidemiology is just throwing some runners, uh, some numbers at you. Uh, running, number one sport in the United States. You won't believe that if you uh, watched uh, ESPN at night, but there are 50 million runners in the United States. Uh, that's a lot of runners. Uh, 720 marathons in the United States. Uh, all those we can be proud, Columbus is the 16th largest. And probably, uh, since we're one of the last races of the year, I have a feeling we're going to just let enough people in to move us up to 13th or 14th this year. Uh, and, 518,000 people finished a marathon in 2011. That's actually kind of a small increase from where we were before. It's the smallest increase we've seen in a while. It's only a 2.2% increase compared to the year before. The years prior to that was almost a 10% increase per year. The reason for that is because we're seeing tremendous growth right now in the half marathon. How many people are training for the half marathon? And how many people are training for the full marathon? And that's about what the numbers are showing right now. Huge growth in the half marathon. Um, gender differences, 60% of people running a marathon are men, 40% female. Half marathon, complete opposite. 60% female, 40% male. Uh, gender differences, you know, we always think of that elite Kenyan running across the finish line of a marathon, because that's the only thing ESPN will show. But the average marathoner, male finisher, 39.6 years old. Average female finisher, 36.4. Uh, zero years old. So they're us, you know, we're the runners of uh, the United States. We're the 50 million people making up the sport right now. And, uh, and, and that's always encouraging to me. And also finish times. When we look at the average finish time, the average male finish time, 4.15. Average female finish time, 4.40. Um, so, you know, when, when we're finishing marathons, you know, the Ethiopians and Kenyans are already on the plane back home. Uh, but we're getting our money's worth, and that's what it's all about. So, moving along. Uh, 
uh, top 10 running injuries. I put this up here just to kind of show you the common things that I see in my office. You know, I see these 10 things every single day. And number one is patellofemoral syndrome. That is runner's knee. We're going to go into a lot of detail on what runner's knee is. Because 50% of all knee pain is runner's knee. One third of all injuries is runner's knee. If a resident or fellow who is with me hasn't learned about runner's knee by the end of it, I'm bagging them on the top of the head. Come on, you gotta get this. Shin splints, very common. Achilles tendonitis, stress fractures. This study showed 7.2% are stress fractures, but I've seen studies as high as about 15%, depending on the population that we're looking at. And then there's our IT band, making about 6.3%. Um, the other thing we look at is uh, knee pain. 50% of all knee pain comes from runner's knee. 25% comes from IT band. Those two diagnoses get 75% of all of our knee injuries. All right? So let's talk about patellofemoral syndrome. Um, this is the start of the Columbus Marathon. That does look like a big city marathon because we are. Uh, pretty excited for those of you who haven't experienced it yet. It's, it's awesome. Uh, this is one of the first years in a while I've actually gotten down to the finish line, got to see all the festivities and excitement. It, it, it's really exciting. You guys will enjoy that. Uh, but runner seat, patellofemoral syndrome. Patella is the kneecap. Femoral is the thigh bone. When I talk about patellofemoral syndrome, I'm referring to that joint between the kneecap and the thigh bone. The, the kneecap sits in a groove at the end of the thigh bone, and it glides nice and smoothly through that groove. Um, and you can see, right here's that kneecap kind of floating up at the top at the undersurface of our quads, and it runs right through this groove. That groove is the patellofemoral joint. Patellofemoral syndrome just means that joint isn't working right. We've done something to offset that joint. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Uh, more common in females, there's some biomechanics that set that up, uh, which I'll show a picture of, uh, but sometimes it's a little bit more common in women. And 25% of all athletes have some patellofemoral syndrome or runner's knee. A uh, very common condition. Uh, one of the important things on this figure is to look at, you know, you have your quadriceps muscles, which are these muscles on the top of our thigh. They come down, our kneecap actually sticks to the back of those muscles. And then those muscles continue on down and attach at the top of the shin bone. Because of that relationship, the way your kneecap is attached to those muscles, these muscles, your quads, control the movement of the kneecap in that groove that it sits in at the end of the thigh bone. What happens with running and cycling and walking? These are sports that really emphasize the muscles on the outside of our thigh. These muscles get to be a lot stronger than the muscles on the inside of our thigh. So instead of that kneecap gliding nice and smoothly through that groove the way it's supposed to, the kneecap gets pulled to the side because these muscles are stronger. And then instead of gliding through that groove, it starts grinding and dragging through that groove. And if you went inside that kneecap uh, and uh, kind of looked inside your knee, there we go, we would see that that area is just all raw, red, and irritated. And that's because of all that grinding it's been doing at the end of the thigh bone. What are the forces uh, going through the patellofemoral joint? This is kind of interesting. Most patients who come into the office will say, it hurts when I kneel, it hurts when I squat, and it hurts when I go up and down stairs. And you might ask, well, why is that? Well, every time we bear weight when we squat down, six times your body weight has to go through that patellofemoral joint. You know, 150 pound person, you're talking about a lot of body weight going through that patellofemoral joint, squatting. Going up and down stairs, 3.3 times your body weight. That's why those activities will aggravate it. Running, same thing. It's going to contribute to those forces. So it's all about forces through that patellofemoral joint. This is what I was talking about in terms of so the biomechanics and set women up just a little bit more for this. Women, the hips are a little bit more towards the side, and so there's a force here that's pulling this kneecap to the side. We call that the Q angle. So if I took where my quadriceps originate over here, right through the center of my kneecap, and then there's a force that comes down to the side over here. You know, it's not a straight line. There's a force to the side pulling that kneecap out naturally. And women have a little bit larger Q angle that sets them up for that, where the kneecap's already trying to pull out to the side. We throw in some muscular imbalances, and it just tips us over. But again, this is not just a female condition. This is really all runners and walkers are predisposed to this. Um, sometimes it's just overuse, overload, doing a little too much, too quick. We know that quadriceps weakness, I talked about that muscular imbalance, plays a very important role in sending people up for this. The other thing that we know is the muscles up in our hip, our hip external rotators. 
are very important in restoring that balance of our quadriceps muscles to control the movement of the kneecap. If your hamstrings are tight, that may contribute. We know that flat feet, high arches, both can contribute. And then that increased QI. Well, those are all risk factors. A lot of these, though, you can't really change. You know, I was kind of born with the QI angle I have. I can't change my QI angle. But I can work on quadricep strengthening, rebalancing those muscles. I can work on hip strengthening. I can work on hamstring tightness and flexibility. So those are some things that we can control. When we look at how people present, people almost always complain of pain on the front of the knee. We call that the anterior aspect of the knee. So runner's knee, front of the knee. IT band, which we're going to talk about in a moment, outside of the knee. So those two diagnoses, which are 75% of all knee pain, you mainly need to know, does it hurt here or does it hurt here? Okay. Um, so front of the knee, pain up and down stairs. Some people complain of catching, kind of clicking in their knee. Uh, that's that irregularity on the back side of the kneecap as they're going up and down stairs. And then we talk about the theater sign. Sitting in a movie theater, sitting on an airplane, with that knee flexed back underneath us, adds to the discomfort. So people say they get really stiff and have to kind of stretch that knee out when they're watching a movie, so the theater sign. Treatment, I kind of already alluded to. It's strengthening our quadriceps, strengthening the muscles over here to work on that balance. Strengthening the muscles like hip external rotators, very important. I also think it's really important kind of seeking somebody out from a physical therapy standpoint who really understands this. I find that a lot of times people kind of get just a generic knee rehab program. But this really takes someone who's kind of sees a lot of runners, knows those muscular imbalances, can identify those, and get you on the right exercises. I find that a lot of people really focus just on the quadriceps piece. And now we're learning that the hip external rotators are a very important part of this. And if we're not targeting all those areas, we may not get you better. The other thing I always suggest with people is strengthening takes time. Just like if I sent you to the gym to get your biceps really big, that doesn't happen overnight. Strengthening can sometimes take six, eight weeks to occur. So don't be discouraged if you're on those exercises, it's not getting better overnight, because it takes time for some of these changes, sometimes even months. But the good news is, structurally, your knee is okay with this condition, usually. You know, your ligaments are fine, your cartilage is fine, so you're not going to do any damage to run on this or walk on this. What I usually say, as long as you aren't limping, I'm okay with you keep going with your activities. But we have to modify that if you're starting to limp, if you're starting to pay for it, can't walk for a day or two afterwards. Uh, if we get some ice on it, we listen to our bodies, usually we can keep you training, and at the same time, work on those strengthening exercises. So, return to running, like I said, activity per pain, and as long as it's not affecting your gait. And usually over two to three months, this is going to go away. All right, IT band syndrome. I already kind of talked a little bit about it. IT stands for iliac, the I, that's your hip bone. T stands for tibia, which is your shin bone. So this is one of the longest muscles in the body, but they're all the way around the outside, right down the seam of your pants. Um, we see a lot in long distance runners. We also see it a lot in cyclists. Uh, risk factors, if your IT band is really tight, it's going to set you up for that. Some of the same muscle weaknesses I talked about with runner's knee can contribute to this as well. And the reason for that is, you know, what happens is, well, let me show you the, the picture here, the anatomy of the first. Here's your IT band. So this is our iliac crest, you know, way up at the top. That IT band comes all the way down and it starts down below the knee on the shin bone. Right here is where most people experience pain. Most people, I'll say 10% of people get IT band up at the hip. That's a separate talk, the hip pain, but it's all the same stuff. But 90% of people get the pain down at the knee. And the reason for that is when this knee is straight, that IT band uh, is in front of the bump at the end of the thigh bone. When I bend my knee, it falls behind that bump. And then when I extend my knee, it snaps over that bump at the end of the thigh bone. Then I bend my knee again, it snaps back. And every time I flex and extend my knee, it's snapping back and forth over that bump at the end of the thigh bone. If our IT band is flexible, if our hip muscles are strong, it's just going to glide over that area. But if our hip muscles are weak, especially our hip external rotators are weak, and that thigh bone is rolling in on us when we're running, that bump at the end of the thigh bone sticks out a lot more. And now I start snapping over that area as opposed to just gliding over that area when my hip external rotators are strong. So those are the important biomechanics for this. Uh, flexibility through our IT band and strength through our hip external rotators and adductors. This is just kind of the description 
of the picture, you know, we're going with our picture Star Wars a thousand words. Mechanism injury, sometimes training errors. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's not, you know, we don't always perceive those until it's a little too late. So, you know, I always recommend you know, follow proper training schedule. You know, if your friends, you know, if you're scheduled for 12 and all your friends are doing 20, do the 12. You know, do yourself a favor. You know, always we're building up that mileage, get that base mileage. That's why we follow schedules. Uh, but training errors are very common with this. The unfortunate thing with IT band is this is a condition I see not now. I see this in September, late September, early October, after you put all that training in and those muscles are starting to fatigue. So you got through that last 20 miler, mile 19, oh my gosh, my knee is killing me. I got a race in three weeks, what can we do? You know, and that's a tough problem. Uh, and uh, a lot of this, restoring those biomechanics, the stretching, the strengthening, they take time to see their impact. So sometimes those changes don't occur overnight. Um, presentation, people are gonna complain of that pain during or after a long run. It'll be on the outside of the knee, Sometimes it'll radiate up the leg just a little bit along the IT band itself. It'll be exacerbated by hills. So frequently if you did like, a, you know, ran through uh, the, the, the dead poets, did those hills or something like that, it might be aggravated. And bank surfaces. Um, and we don't think about that too much when we're running on the banks of the old Tangier. We've got a nice, you know, smooth, flat surface that we're running on. It banks this way sometimes. It banks that way sometimes. But if you're doing a lot of mileage on roads, which I do, that's where I log a lot of my miles, Roads have a crown to them, so we can drain water. And if we're always running against traffic, we're going to end up with a leg discrepancy, where one leg is going to be a little bit longer than the other leg because you're running with the, you know, the left side is going to be on the low side, the right leg is going to be on the high side. And so that's a risk factor, and that's a preventable risk factor. That's something I suggest get on the bike path. You know, I, I used to live about three miles from the bike path. It seemed kind of lazy, but I'd get in my car and I'd drive to the trailhead, and I would run from there. Um, you know, get on those bike paths. You know, they're also a lot safer than running on the roads. Um, if you have to run on the roads, be safe, but maybe try to mix it up a little bit. Run with traffic, run against traffic, but only if it's safe. Make sure you're visible, get a flashing light out there if it's early in the morning, be safe. But that's something we can sometimes do to minimize some of those risks of the IT van. Uh, treatment, relative rest, just like runners need. You know, we can back off our training a little bit. A lot of people will come in and say, you know, Doc, it's every time I get to mile nine, we'll get a whole bunch of 8.5 mile runs in. Do what it will let you do right now. Uh, listen to your body. And when it starts acting up, shut it down. You know, don't go out for a 20 mile where you get out 10 miles and you can't get back when it starts aggravating. Keep it close to home. Ice, ice is very effective. I'm a huge ice fan for runners, me too. But for IT band, a lot of that pain we get, one of the things I didn't mention, is at the end of the thigh bone, there's a little bursa. A bursa is a fluid-filled sac. It's kind of like a water bowl. It sits in between the muscle and the bone. And it allows a muscle to glide smoothly over a bone. So that sharp pain, like, man, someone's just stabbing me right there. That's bursitis. So IT band is actually a type of bursitis. But we call it IT band syndrome. We don't want to get confused with grandma. Uh, and most people think that only happens in older people, bursitis. But this is a bursitis type thing. Uh, and bursitis, the itis means inflammation. Very responsive to ice. So lots and lots of ice over that area after you get done running. Anti-inflammatories, the you know, last talk I talked about, I'm not a huge fan of anti-inflammatories. Um, uh, the studies really haven't shown they do that much for inflammation. Uh, and for these conditions, I don't find that they do that much for. If you're having a lot of pain though, pain getting around, certainly taking one is probably going to alleviate some of the pain and we need to do that. That's okay. But don't take them and take them scheduled because you think you need to in order for this to get better. It's not going to help that much. But if you're having a lot of pain, it's okay to take. And then again, physical therapy. We need to identify those muscular imbalances, those weaknesses, get you going on some very specific exercises to strengthen those hip, external rotators, abductors, work on that flexibility. I'm also a big fan of the foam roller. I know they're around here somewhere. We can, there we are. We can roll that IT band, roll those knots out. There'll be a lot of different knots up in there. Don't roll on the bone though. You don't want to come right on the bone. You don't want to come down the bone. Get that meaty part of the muscle. Just kind of roll that out. And that's a good preventative strategy. I know we are just talking with uh, uh, somebody in the MIT group here who uses his stick, uses his roller quite a bit preventively. And a lot of people will roll that IT band, so that can help as well. I do a technique called ART, active release technique. It's kind of a deep tissue massage technique. It doesn't feel very comfortable while we do it. Works a little differently than a regular massage, but it can help to release that IT band if it's being stubborn. 
So when people come in that three weeks before the race, what am I going to do? You know, I don't know if our physical therapy is going to help get you better in that time frame. Sometimes the ART, ART might be the, the magic bullet. Sometimes we have to do other things, like uh, an injection. I won't leave that up there long. Uh, but this is something that can help. Uh, again, it's a bursitis. Bursitis is inflammation. We can fill that bursa up with a steroid, which is a potent anti-inflammatory, and sometimes it can get you through the race. Uh, not all the time. I always tell people it's about a 50-50 proposition. And I normally don't recommend doing it unless you say, I know I can't run right now. And I'm like, let's just throw the sink at it. You know, let's just see what we can do. It might get you through. Um, so that's an injection. We usually do, I probably do about 15 of those the week before the race, uh, just, to, just trying to get people through. But, you know, you put a lot of training in, you put a lot of effort in. I understand we want to do whatever we can to get there. Um, risk of injection, pretty minimal when it comes to this area. A lot of the bad things you hear about injections are related to in the joint itself. This isn't going in the joint. This is all soft tissue injection, very safe, uh, fairly well tolerated. Um, biggest thing we see is sometimes risk of infection, risk of bleeding, very minimal. We do everything we can to minimize that. The only other thing we see is sometimes people's symptoms get worse for 24 to 48 hours. That's why we don't do these on Saturday. I normally recommend doing it on Monday or Tuesday. Get through that flare. That only happens about 5 to 10 percent of people. Get through your flare so come race day you're ready to go. And then rarely we sometimes need to do some uh, orthotics, you know, looking at uh, or, and, and, uh, your body mechanics and stuff like that. So activity uh, per pain, make sure it's not affecting your gait, make sure you're not limping, uh, and uh, that should get you through. So that's all I have, uh, kind of talking about the two conditions. This is Lexi, right back there, holding the banner for the uh, Coast Marathon. Uh, she and my uh, other, uh, Lexi, my other daughter, were fun to show that, are holding the banner up. So let's take some questions and see where we go from there. And then we got to run to get in and some food, I think. Any questions? What about a meniscus tear? Is that something you to yeah, great question. So meniscus tear, kind of unrelated to these conditions, meniscus tears, I, I normally think of two types. There's uh, uh, the, the type that my daughter gets, uh, you know, the younger age group, uh, that kind of gets, you know, a whipping type injury or twisting type injury, and they tear that cartilage. Um, and then we have the type that I get, or the degenerative meniscal tear. And what happens is we age, we start to lose the water content in our cartilage. And then it, instead of like just being a nice clean tear, you know, in, in an older patient, what we find, and, and really that's anybody over the, you know, over, over my daughter's age, uh, we, it unravels, and it just kind of frays. And that's what we call a degenerative meniscal tear. And again, it, that, you know, degenerative sounds old, but really that, that just means probably in your 20s. We get these degenerative type tears. Those behave differently. The ones that are kind of the younger type tears, Frequently, those are going to need surgery. So that's a big tear. We're going to need to clean those out. They've actually done studies on cadavers. Found 52% of them uh, have cartilage tears, those degenerative frame type tears. Most of those are fairly well tolerated, depending on the size and location. Occasionally, though, they will be a source for pain. And unfortunately, cartilage is a structure in our knee that isn't capable of healing. It doesn't have a blood supply. Blood doesn't flow to it and bring the nutrients it needs to heal. So once it's torn, it's torn. And so if the pain doesn't subside over, I usually think, four, six, maybe eight weeks on its own, it's probably one they need to go on and clean out. So, having said that, you know, what about safety in terms of running with meniscal tears and knees? Um, studies haven't shown, unless you've had a major knee reconstruction, removed all of your cartilage, those are the people maybe at risk for arthritis with running. If you've had a small little meniscectomy, just, you know, kind of cleaned it up, most of those people are going to be fine running, have no concerns running with their nutrients. Are the symptoms common to runner's knee? Uh, no. Uh, meniscal tears are going to be very localized to the joint line. So the most meniscal tears are going to be medial, which will be right on uh, that right in between the, the shin bone and the thigh bone. You can have a lateral one, and that's the one rarely, but sometimes you can confuse IT band with a lateral meniscus tear. The difference is the IT band pain is going to be above the joint line, on the bump at the end of the thigh bone, as opposed to between the two bones. Uh, but sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish those two. One other question I get a lot is uh, arthritis in running. Uh, and actually a great new study came out looking at one of the, uh, uh, a series of runners over their lifetime. Uh, There's almost 100,000 runners. And what they found is that running decreased your risk for arthritis. And the more you ran, the less arthritis you had. The people that ran five or more marathons a year had less arthritis. 
So it dispels all that negative things you hear uh, from the medical establishment saying that running is bad, just stop running, it's going to cause arthritis. There's no scientific basis for that. Yeah, so that can come from a lot of different things. Pain in the back of the knee. Uh, co most common thing is going to be hamstrings. Uh, so you can get a hamstring strain of either the, uh, the lateral hamstring or the medial hamstring muscles as they cross the knee. Uh, other common cause is some people can get a Baker cyst, which is a cyst that form in the back of the knee. It can be, I just saw somebody the other day had one that was an inch and a half big. Uh, you know, I think that would be just bulging out, but you know, an inch and a half can kind of hide back in there. You can barely even feel it. And it can be a source for pain. Uh, difficulty flexing the knee all the way because it's getting blocked. Uh, but typically in the back of the knee I think of hamstring and I also think of your calf muscles that kind of come in right above and they kind of wrap over the hamstring muscles and attach there. So you should think strain. Um, there's some, usually, you know, most strains will. I just had yeah. walking over here, now I don't feel it Yeah, and that, and yeah, and yeah, I'd probably say that might just tweak your, you know, gastroc or soleus and, you know, just giving it some time. And if it persists, you know, it might be some more direct therapy we can do for a medial knee pain the front of the knee? Um, yeah, uh, patellofemoral will frequently, you know, when I say on the front of the knee, people will usually go like this, and they take their fingers and they wrap them around the kneecap. Some people will complain of it just being right on the inside of the knee, some people will complain of it just being right around the outside of the kneecap. So yes, either or. Um, then the other thing that we see, it's a little bit more medial, is your hamstring muscles come from behind, they split, and one wraps around to the front of the shin. And so sometimes you can get a hamstring injury that will present right on kind of the, the front inside part of your knee. And it's what we call pes anserine bursitis, and it's more related to your hamstrings. What about um, like those spurs on your knee? Yeah, bone spurs are going to be more related to arthritis. So that's a type of arthritis. Um, and it just depends on, I wouldn't worry so much about the bone spur, I'd worry more about the degree of arthritis. <laughs> Uh, and how severe that is, because you know, I mentioned the arthritis studies, but once you have severe arthritis, you know, moderately severe arthritis, uh, running can aggravate your arthritis, and so it can sometimes accelerate that. Uh, so that's it once established. But you know, mild little bone spurs and mild to moderate arthritis, I don't worry as much about. Is there a good measure that you do? For arthritis? Yeah, just in general, I would say, you know, a lot of the things I talked about are muscle imbalances, weaknesses, and flexibility. So, you know, we did a study uh, here recently, kind of still reviewing all the results, but hip strengthening, I think, is very important, keeping our hips strong, so our abductor muscles, external rotator muscles. That's what Sean's going to talk about when we get that talk rescheduled. But on the MIT website, there's the Runner and Walkers 10. Uh, there's even a video on there. Uh, so maybe we just put the video up when Sean's gone, because uh, it's a video that he's given this talk before. So you can see those exercises working on strengthening your hips. So that's the biggest thing. Obviously, coming here, getting fitted for proper running shoes is going to be very important. Make sure your foot mechanics are right. Uh, and then that, that stick, foam rolling type stuff uh, can, can definitely be beneficial. Cool. And then the surfaces, you know, some of those types of things we're talking about. I'm going to take one more and then we'll... Yeah, one more question. There's going to be... Okay. Or no more. All right. Is there any correlation between if you're getting arthritis in your hands? Yeah, I haven't seen that. Uh, but, um, yeah, I haven't seen studies with that. But, you know, I'd say if you have arthritis in multiple areas, possibly. It just depends on how that arthritis develops.